Hello and welcome. My name is Mariella McElwraith. I'm the Director of Industry Advancement with the Events Industry Council. And I'm thrilled today to be joined by Mark Cooper from IAC, uh, Yama Siddiqui from MGM Resorts International, and Marta Munoz from the Ministry of Ecological Transition here in Spain, who will be talking to us about the efforts uh, of, of putting together this phenomenal event today. Uh, our topic uh, today is to look at bringing people together for climate and the role of the events industry. So I thought I'd start off by introducing a little bit about uh, my organization, the Events Industry Council. Uh, we are a federation of associations in the events industry, and we come together to tackle the big issues that none of these individual associations can tackle alone. And that includes looking at issues such as the climate crisis. So together, these 30 plus associations represent over 100,000 individuals, over 19,000 firms, and are, we're located in, in nearly 100 countries through the reach of all of our member organizations. This year, recognizing the urgent need to act, we have established the new Center for Sustainable Events. Within that center, we have principles for sustainable events. These are voluntary principles, uh, new sustainable event standards, as well as lots of different uh, online education options, resources, and a sustainable event professional certificate. Before we get into the, some of the case uh, studies that we're going to look at today, I wanted to put a little bit of a context around the economic significance of business events. So we represent 26 million direct and indirect jobs, one and a half trillion dollars uh, US in global GDP, and one and a half billion participants are reached in 180 countries. So what does that mean in this context? Well, that means that we have, through our industry, the, the ability and the responsibility to provide safe and fair working conditions for 26 million jobs, to direct one and a half trillion dollars to responsible supply chains, and also to catalyze the 1.5 billion participants in those 180 countries. So I just want you to think for a moment about the butterfly effect that happens when we're able to reach these 1.5 billion people and encourage them to take action on climate. But it's not just about our economic impact, it's also about our social impact of business events. It's about the impact that we have on individuals, on hosting communities, and the sector as a whole as well. And I'd like to also just frame this in terms of to find solutions to some of the world's biggest challenges, including the climate crisis, we really do need the power of face-to-face -face events. Face-to-face -face events, are incredible. One of our member organizations is known for saying, when we meet, we change the world. Well, in this time of crisis, what I'm going to say is that we, we need to adjust that. We need to elevate that to say, when we meet, we must change the world. And more importantly, when we meet, we are the world. And this is important that the world come together and all of the voices be heard and shared so that we can come up with the solutions needed to address this crisis. Some of the, uh, the aspects of uh, events that are really going to be essential for, uh, for addressing climate include the ability to collaborate. So co collaboration is inherent in the way business events are designed. It's also an opportunity for us to hold each other accountable. So we, we make promises, we set goals, and when we come together, we hold each other accountable to those promises and to those goals. And then there's something else that happens with face-to-face with -face events, and that's that serendipity, those chance encounters that we don't plan for, but are so important for moving us forward. And I actually have a challenge to each of you here today, is that you go and you orchestrate those serendipitous uh, encounters. You go out there and you meet someone new. You push yourself outside of your comfort zone and, and you introduce yourselves to someone doing something great and innovative here and you learn and you share with them. It's also about leaving legacy. So I want to start with some of the case examples that I'd like to share, and this is from uh, Timberland. Uh, they have uh, made a, a conscious effort to introduce community service projects with all of their events. So wherever they go in the world, they're doing things to help support the climate, support, support the environment, and support the communities. Now, in terms of the approach that we're taking at the Events Industry Council, 
to address climate, we're looking at it in terms of parallel paths. And what I mean by, by that is that we're going to start by the really challenging long-term uh, part of the, of the journey, which is to embed sustainability, embed climate action into the way that we operate. So we do that by integrating it into things like our international standards for the certified meeting professional. So we have 12,000 certified meeting professionals in 46 uh, different countries currently. And now it's an expectation of them to understand sustainability in the way that they plan their events. We've also uh, just launched provisional EIC sustainable event standards. And those do include climate action requirements as part of the standards. But we know that that's a long-term focus. And we know that we need to act now, today, urgently, and in big, bold ways. So I want to sh share some of those ideas as well. So here we have an example from the World Wild Wild Wildlife Fund that has, has, has established the Hotel Kitchen Project, which is really looking at transforming operations in hotels to fight food waste. So those are some of the big picture items. But we also have individual chefs that are looking to transform things. This is a chef uh, based in uh, Bangkok, uh, the uh, Marriott Marquis. And uh, he has made it a goal to make sure that, that trimmings and all these uh, small items are integrated and has introduced a taste the waste program where things that might normally get discarded are actually showcased. And we're also seeing events uh, look at integrating uh, entirely vegan menus. And Mark is going to be sharing a little bit about that as well from, uh, from his experiences. The events industry is also focusing more on the circular economy, recognizing that the materials that we use, we need to be more responsible in our choices. So we're seeing uh, many of our suppliers start to integrate uh, better choices, such as uh, recyclable materials. All of these images here are uh, items that at the end of your trade show you can recycle. And we use this actually for our recent uh, trade show in Las Vegas. Uh, all of it was made out of re uh, recyclable materials, but uh, we did one better, and that was that we actually found a purpose for those uh, after the event. So they still have some, uh, some life in them. And then there's creativity that can happen as well. So this is an example from the Salt Palace Convention Center that hosted a flooring show. And afterwards, we're left with thousands of those little carpet samples. So they worked with a local artist to design a very large mural that is now a permanent art installation at the, at the convention center. And this, uh, this is a depiction of the first uh, US female state senator elected in the United States. In addition to doing better, we also recognize that we're going to need to step up. And we're going to need to step up because there's going to be an increased demand in our venues to provide mega shelter services in times of climate-related disasters. So we have one of our associations is currently working on a mega shelter planning guide and updating this. That's the International Association of Venue Managers is looking at helping more of the large venues, uh, convention centers, be ready to house people when these uh, increasing number of climate emergencies are happening. We're also seeing more focus on climate neutral events. So there are individual actions that you can take. So uh, for our travel here, we went onto the Climate Neutral Now uh, site and selected uh, a carbon offset uh, project uh, based in Chile. And, uh, but in addition to those individual actions, we're seeing uh, larger events uh, make decisions on behalf of their participants. So this is uh, uh, the IMEX group uh, has um, purchased carbon offsets for all of their hosted buyer travel with the support of the Costa Rica Tourism Board. We're also seeing uh, organizations like the Thailand Convention and Exhibition Bureau in uh, collaboration with uh, the uh, Thailand Greenhouse Gas Management Organization supporting 15 uh, carbon neutral events and reducing approximately 2,000 tons of carbon emissions through this program. Or another option here is uh, the venues are starting to look at this as well. So Radisson Meetings uh, has just announced this past year that all meetings in every single one of the 1,100 Radisson hotels will be carbon neutral, and that will be at a, at a cost neutral um, impact for the, for the event organizers. 
So I'd like to uh, next invite uh, Mark uh, to come up and tell us a little bit about what's happening with, uh, with IAC and encourage you to every time that you meet, take the, the time to make sure that we're actually doing something positive and meaningful for climate action. Thank you. Thank you, Mariella. Oh. The power of events is phenomenal. And we're seeing that this week here at this convention by bringing people together there's a huge opportunity to be able to change the world at a much faster pace, as Mariella talked about. And what I'd like to do is to start by highlighting the other side of large conventions like this, which, as well as being incredible, incredibly powerful, those smaller conferences, those meetings, those strategic sessions, those training courses are all catalysts for us to be able to touch and educate a number of people. And by Adopting best practices around the world, we have that opportunity for our attendees to go away from our events and do positive things on their own. Our association, IAC, represents 400 venues around the world. It's not a huge number, but when you consider those 400 venues around the world look after over 2 million events a year, you can see how the small meetings market contributes to the, the huge number, the 1.5 billion conference and meeting attendees that are out there. What I'd like to highlight with the stories that I'm gonna tell you and the case studies from some of our members around the world is just how nimble and passionate these smaller venues can be with these entrepreneurial owners, these ideas that they can cultivate and turn into positive practice very quickly. And of course, these are organizations that are hosting large global companies, and we have that chance to touch them. IAC's journey began from a sustainability perspective at the beginning of this year in terms of creating huge momentum. I was in one of our chapter conference rooms with our European board, very diverse group from all over Europe, and we watched some of the compelling vi videos of Greta Thunberg, of Sir David Attenborough. And very quickly that group unanimously decided that they are going to be the association in the meetings industry that um, represent the knowledge bank, the thought that people can come to for advice. Very quickly from that point we turned to the Events Industry Council and their sustainability program and said we need help. We need help to be able to be seen and to be able to do things the right way at our own events for our own members. And I returned from San Francisco with our Americas chapter just last week, where for the first time our Americas board spent quality time together at the San Francisco Marin Food Bank, uh, contributing to the community. What I would say is from all of the momentum that we've seen in the last year, from a strategic level, the one thing that this topic and this sense of urgency has done is it's really embraced a huge amount of solidarity um, uh, within our members. And I'll talk a little bit about that around our conference and how it affected that. So we took the decision to take the conference to Brussels. We did that unselfishly because it has an excellent train network from France, from London. We could get people to our conference in a very sustainable way. As I mentioned, not only did we want to put on an event that was sustainable in, its, you know, in everything we did around food and beverage, technology, transportation, of which we did some really cool things, but as you can see here, we brought sustainable meetings to the heart of the event. We made everything that we did from an educational perspective all about creating sustainable meetings. And yes, our keynote speaker um, had one purpose, which was to scare us to death, which was to give us the harsh reality of where we are today and just how serious it is. And then the two days after that, with 150 leaders from conference venues and hotels around the world, we started to build the building blocks of what we can do better and the part that we can play. We ended our event with our World Cafe. And our World Cafe was all about encapsulating those ideas, bringing them together, and coming away with just three standards that we could embrace as a community, as a group, and um, I will share some of those with you. The eradication of all single-use plastic bottles, which venues you know, have been known for historically. You know the saying, it's no, no longer your parents' meeting? 
well, we need to make sure we design the meeting environments when, that were not those environments that our parents used to come to. So that was the first pledge. The other was the removal of all single-use coffee cups in guest rooms. That's our commitment and our pledge that will go beyond Europe and into our other chapters as well. And lastly, one of the most important areas that we realise that we need to address is our members, those who operate the meeting venues around the world, they want to change, but they lack some of the information to be able to do it. They need that connection to great suppliers. They need to be able to know how to do things differently. So we will create, working with the Events Industry Council, an online repository of information, of people that can help make a difference to give and empower our members to be able to do that. To summarize the events as well, we had our largest attendance to the event, we had our most positive feedback, even though our topic was so granular. And we came away having achieved Mariella's uh, uh, standard, event standard for sustainable meetings that was just introduced, having been the first organization to achieve gold standard just this week. So we're thrilled that we've done enough to be able to get gold, but we're hungry to be able to do more around our meetings. The second case study that I want to share is our Culinary Chefs Competition, the IAC Global Copper Skillet Competition. For years we've had uh, a mystery protein basket that our chefs have to choose from and cook from and compete with their um, fellow chefs from around the world. Three proteins, normally two meat and one fish. This year we changed and shifted significantly because we realized we need to do that. We went to three plant-based proteins and only two meat-based proteins. I'm incredibly excited to say that just a few short weeks ago, in our competition in Canada, our winning chef was the first chef in the competition this year to choose two meat-free proteins and to win the Canadian competition based on that. Presentation, taste, their control of waste as well around their food preparation were all new parts of the, the program and the criteria for our judges. So if we put this on a platform, we can educate the industry, but also our meeting planner community to the excitement of to the alternatives. And the last one is the one that um, brings a few goosebumps to the back of my neck when I tell the story. It's one of our members in a, in a region called Sigtuna, uh, just outside of Stockholm in Sweden, a 130 bedroom conference centre looking after business meetings. They came up with the idea that they would, lo they would engage a local seamstress to design and cut all of their staff uniforms from recycled materials. And don't they look happy here? This group of individuals um, not only are uh, embracing the sustainable practices through using recycled materials, but more importantly, remember those 1.5 um, billion attendees to events that Mariella talked about earlier? They're talking to them day in and day out at their conferences. They're being asked about their uniforms. They're telling their story. And they are motivating the attendees at our events. And ladies and gentlemen, that's what we've got to do more of in the coming years. Um, with help, there is hope. And there is, these are just some examples of some of the great initiatives and innovation and creativity that we want to foster and embrace and do more of. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. I'd like to invite Ayama Siddiqui from MGM Resorts now to talk to us a little bit going from the, the small venues to the mega venues, the, the large uh, venues. Ayama, if you can tell us a little bit about your stories. Thank you, Mariella. Thank you, Mark. And thanks to the UNFCCC for not only putting on this, uh, this event, but also hosting side events like this and live streaming for those on the um, live stream and who are gonna watch the recording in, in, in the future. Um, I wanna start by answering this question that we've been posed in this session, which is bring people together for climate. What is the role of the events industry? And my first role recommendation is to have more of these live streams so that you can broaden the audience for content to more people in the world who cannot make it to the event that you're hosting. That's a a, a, a pretty significant um, idea for maybe every future event, more uh, availability of live stream and on demand. 
In terms of live, you heard from Mariella how great and valuable it is to bring people together to work on important topics like climate. Um, one of the really important things, though, as you, do, as you do that, is to really think hard about the climate impact of the event and the sustainability of the event and incorporate more sustainable event elements, social and environmental benefits, into the event design for current events and, per this slide, upcoming events. Make sure that list of elements that you're including in future events continues. There's a never-ending list of things you can do to make events better. So one major role of the events industry as they bring people together is to continue improving our events, both live and on demand. So one of the advantages of meeting live is you can do this. You can sit around a meal and you can discuss topics and maybe accelerate progress on that topic quicker than you might have if you were meeting virtually or meeting on the phone because there's something about food that brings people together and allows them to connect in different ways than if there wasn't food. And the reason I want to introduce food is that's really the, um, the, um, the main theme of my talk. And uh, Sorry, I can't read the title. But it's really about the events, food, and climate nexus. And um, the three main messages I want to share are that first, live events are really key intervention points in the food climate nexus. They're really important. Secondly, food and food waste is a much bigger part of the climate puzzle than many people in the world realize. And then thirdly, it's smart for venues and planners who work with venues to focus first on this really important and complex topic of food waste and work on reducing food waste at the source and diverting it from landfill if it can't be reduced at the source. So the conclusion for that um, is that because food and beverage have much higher embodied carbon than many people realize, it's a very important part of the puzzle to uh, think about climate and when making food choices. Third point, it's very smart for venues and planners to focus on first, first on food waste um, and reducing food waste and diverting food waste from landfill as part of their solution to make their event uh, more climate friendly. And here's the surprising fact. If food waste, if food loss and waste, that in includes food loss in the agricultural supply chain, if food loss and waste were a country, it would be the world's third largest country, third largest emitter of carbon um, after China and the United States. The third largest country based on aggregated uh, emissions just associated with food we're producing, but then not using. That is an enormous, enormous problem, but it's also an enormous opportunity. Now, as caterers and planners of, of meetings and venues hosting meetings, it's very valuable to think about this hierarchy when, when making plans around food waste. This is the EPA food recovery hierarchy. At the top is source reduction, so finding ways to order the right amount not produce too much. Number two, down the hierarchy is feeding hungry people. If you've got food left over, find ways to donate it to feed, feed hungry people. Um, then industrial uses, composting, and the worst thing to do is send things to landfill. Um, this is a slight twist of the hierarchy, um, main points being only donate food to people if you can donate it safely. Same for animals, only donate if it can be done safely and then only to send to compost if it's clean. And then finally, if you can't achieve any of these up other uh, opportunities, then landfill is the final choice. Um, the surprising lesson from MGM in Las Vegas is whereas many people think of Las Vegas as a world center for food waste, we're actually a world center for effective food waste management. And this um, slide depicts the total weight of food waste diverted from landfill uh, since 2007 by one company, MGM Resorts, 200, over 200,000 tons 
of food waste, not going to landfill, but going to other, source, other destinations because of proactive food waste management programs. And this chart now converts that material diversion into carbon avoidance. So if you look at the brown bars, they um, show uh, emissions associated with, with um, materials that did go to landfill, food and all different types of materials. But the, the, the um, dashed bar shows carbon emissions avoided through food waste diversion practices, including uh, sending food to farms, sending, fuel, sending grease to biofuel, uh, sending compostables to compost that becomes fertilizer, sending oysters back to the ocean to replenish oyster, oyster um, ecosystems, and donating food to people if it can be done safely. And just a quick couple of points, both non-perishable food, perishable unprepared food, and perishable prepared food are donated. And last month, uh, MGM hit a milestone of a million meals donated safely from five convention resorts. And our target is five million meals by the end of 2025. So to close, a couple of lessons for venues in terms of food waste management. Designate champions to uh, uh, Im improve food waste performance. Explore multiple methods. Engage local districts to donate food and invest in broad sets of solutions. For planners, when possible, choose venues that manage food waste effectively. It's not just us, many, many venues around the world manage food waste effectively, and, but some don't. And so if they don't, encourage them to start and recognize that it's difficult. This is a very complicated area because it's very easy to send food waste to landfills, much harder to, to develop other solutions. Uh, but asking as a planner will help the venues accelerate. And then finally, um, thanks again to UNFCC for um, having both us come live and on demand.